Thank you. Um, I got the biggest question, so I hope reading it doesn't count against no, my two minutes. Count. It says, one of Laney College's institutional learning outcomes is the following. Global awareness, ethics, and civil responsibility. Students will be prepared to practice community engagement that addresses one or more of the following. Environmental responsibility, social justice, cultural diversity. What suggestions do you have for how the mayor's office, the Oakland business community, and other governmental agencies housed in Oakland can help Laney College professionals prepare students to successfully attain this outcome? Starting, starting now. Okay, thank you. Okay, two big ideas. You know, 20 years ago, we had a tremendous strategic planning organization in Oakland that involved 1,500 people working together to solve issues relating to public safety, housing, economic development, public education, and the arts. We want to bring that back, as well as a neighborhood-based, citywide organization of people who in their own communities will be organized to empower themselves to advocate for the kind of change we need in this society. Number one focus has to be jobs. We need to create jobs in Oakland. Some quick ideas. We want the Culinary Institute here at Laney to expand to become a world-class training program for our hospitality industry to train hundreds of high school graduates for jobs in all the great restaurants and the growing hotels that we have in the city. Two, Oakland should be a 100% solar city that will help the environment. We could put hundreds of people to work fabricating and installing solar panels throughout the city at little or no cost to residents. Three, we need world band, world class broadband, world class broadband in Oakland that will help us attract high tech jobs such as the University of California Institute that will work on global warming and climate change. We need a municipal internet service provider, such as they have now in Chattanooga, Tennessee, so everyone can be on the net and so our lower income residents can have it for free. We need cooperative business organizations, as they have in Cleveland. We can put the recently incarcerated to work, doing construction, doing painting, doing good jobs, again, at the $15 minimum wage. We could create other uh, co-ops to do landscaping, to do other types of work. In Cleveland, they created a massive laundry operation to service hospitals and other large institutions in the city of Cleveland. There are up to 500 people being put to work. We've got to focus on jobs. Those are a half a dozen of my suggestions. The best program for a safe city is not more cops, I'm sorry, there's no proof that 900 or 1,000 or 1,500 cops will make Oakland safer. We can't afford them anyway. We have to put our people to work. Thank you, thank you. Want Brian Parker? Is this on? There we go. Yeah, so obviously somebody was reading the Chronicle last week. I was kind with this question where we were featured on there for innovation and technology. My question says, our rapidly expanding technology requires uh, that we facilitate the development of transferable skill sets and adaptive learning. How would you assist uh, Laney in achieving this objective? So our friend uh, Van Jones uh, tells this story, uh, and there are two people with uh, hoodies, and one is black and one is white. Uh, and they say, what, what is the difference between these two? Uh, and what Van says is uh, that the one on the left, uh, or the white one, uh, is Mark Zuckerberg, the founder uh, of Facebook. Uh, and that the one on the right uh, is Trayvon Martin. And we know uh, what happened there. I want to look at a uh, world and a society where we look and see that the next hooded person or whatever they're looking like is going to be the next founder of Facebook or Google, and that's going to come uh, right here from Oakland, maybe right here from Laney. I think that the key here is inclusion. How do we include uh, all of our folks and make sure that nobody is left out? Uh, what we are doing and what I'm proposing uh, is starting a requirement of computer science as early as the fifth grade. 
And this is important for a few reasons. Number one, uh, studies show that we have a climate uh, where we're having our kids use uh, computers and iPads, et cetera, but we're not teaching them how to use it. They're playing video games for 10 and 12 hours a day, yet they don't know how to create those video games. So what I would like to do is show them how to code. This past weekend, we started uh, a thing that said, learn to code with Brian Parker. And we had over 40 kids spilling out of a room, learning to code on a Saturday. So uh, it is very possible, and why this matters. Our budget here in Oakland is $1.2 billion. Last year, technology investments between Oakland, Berkeley, and Emeryville combined were $250 million. If we had had 10% of the $12 billion that was invested, that would be $1.2 billion. $1.2 billion in fresh capital would change the complexion of this city in one fell swoop. So how would I work with Laney? I would work with Laney by making sure that we had code academies here that our partners like uh, Pandora and Sungevity were here and working in labs, that we were running experiments, that we were running job programs so that the kids that were here that were learning how to code uh, and coming and doing these partnerships would have jobs remaining on the other side. We have a chance to transform Oakland, but this has to be done uh, by being inclusive. This would be done by having coding academies in East and West Oakland, making sure that we had businesses in West Oakland, using some of the old uh, shutdown factories that are in East Oakland to manufacture some of these solar panels so that everybody could pursue and participate in this economic upside. Uh, I think that the chance that we have here is transformative. Uh, I would welcome everybody to come out. We're gonna be having uh, a thousand person tech conference, uh, which I helped organize. It'll be in Oakland next Tuesday and Wednesday. We're gonna have some of the best VCs tech companies and entrepreneurs from around the world. So I'm not waiting till I'm mayor. I'm already showing the leadership now uh, and reaching out not only to Laney, but to the high school kids and to the grammar school kids and asking them to come participate. Because make no mistake about it, that the next founder of Google or Facebook is in this room or they're somewhere out in Oakland. Thank you, thank you. There has been more recently a lot of discussions about the future of Oakland sports franchises. We now know that the Oakland, the Warriors are leaving, and there's been discussions about uh, the Raiders leaving, and as well as the uh, Oakland Athletics. The question is, do you think it's necessary and viable for the continuation uh, in the city that, uh, that efforts are made to keep either one or both of these franchises, and if so, why? Thank you for that question. And uh, my position on the sports teams is that we have got to look at viable proposals and we have got to get real about this. So I am always going to look at proposals on whether they're the best for the city. And as mayor, I'm gonna focus on public safety every day. That's gonna be my focus. When we look at economic development, I have yet to see a proposal around the sports teams that pencils out, that even pencils. So the political leaders of the city can bring you ideas but we need facts and figures. And as mayor, I will have an independent budget analyst that will bring those numbers because I believe that in order to really guide and lead the city to financial success, we're going to need to have numbers to determine if it's in the best interest of the city. So with the sports teams right now, we, ha we haven't been provided those numbers and uh, so that would be. So your position is an accounting issue? That is to say you don't have the numbers, uh, the, the, dot, the data, so you can't make a decision about it? Or is, the hey. question here is that in following up on uh, the statement, is the position rooted in the fact that right now you don't have enough uh, information and accounting-wise to make an evaluation as to whether it was, it's good or not for the city? Uh, that's first question. Second question, from your point of view, is it good or not for the city to have and spend any kind of resources trying to maintain these two uh, 
sports franchises? So it's not just an accounting question to me. It is a question of resources and priorities. So when we look at this, um, we have to understand what we know about uh, decisions with the sports teams is that it really is about public-private investment. There is no way that the city can fund keeping the sports teams here. So if they, we are talking with developers about initiating these arenas or the different, the ballpark or with the sports teams, then we need to know what the investment will be. So I'm always gonna look to the data. That's who I am. And that's who I've consistently been. And the last part of that question was? Should we uh, invest, should we invest any time or effort uh, in trying to maintain these franchises? Because, or do you see, it, is there any good, any goodwill or public good by even uh, having these franchises if it costs the city or the county uh, money? Again, I think that it is, it's wonderful to have the teams here, but we can't afford you know, the city doesn't have the money to invest in it. So we have to, got to see that there are partners that are willing to invest, and that's gonna be important. The city's not gonna be able to write this, pay this, this bill. Good, thank you. <clears throat> now my pet peeve is the Oakland Police Department. <laughs> and, and to that, we have been involved, and this is going to be to Joseph, Joe, that we have been involved in, in litigation for the last forever, if you will. A great deal of money has been spent. And the question whether or not you as a mayor can have the necessary commitment and our vision uh, to get the department into compliance and at the same time uh, improve the quality of policing at the same time having a constitutionally uh, um, engaging police officers, and, and how do you see that come in the past? Uh, okay, John, thank you uh, for asking that question. So let me answer it this way. I noticed there was lots of applause for the previous uh, speech that Dan gave, great speech, when he asserted that it uh, doesn't matter how many police officers you have, uh, jobs are more important. I want you to think about the logic of that for a moment. I understand there's a contentious relationship. That's why John and Dan have had a lot of work in the last couple of years between the police department and residents of our community. But to go from that to a statement, which I think, to be honest with you, is a little irresponsible, that police don't matter, that if you just give jobs to people, everybody will behave in a civil way and you'll never have problems, is not reality. It's not reality. I am the father of a son who was violently assaulted last summer trying to rescue someone who had been mugged in Uptown. There were no police around. He chased a mugger six blocks, cornered him, asked for her purse back, and was treated to the brick at the back of his head and a ritual stomping by three of that person's friends that almost put him into a coma. A former college athlete with lots of problems in the head already from playing sports was severely beaten. He couldn't find a police officer that was, that was done, and he had to move on. Let me ask you this question. So let me, let me answer let me, let me your question, you, though. Let me ask you okay? the question. Cops do matter. Okay, that's your point. I got that. So assuming that that's true, the question I'm asking, do you have any particular data that you can reference that says the more cops that you have, the less the crime, crime is, recognizing that the national data is that crime is, in fact, going down, even though the police, the number of police officers is also going down. And I'm just curious about the position. Okay, so if you ask me after this, I'll cite you the studies. I can tell you there are it's studies not, that make oh, that it's claim. It's not for me, it's for them. But I'm okay. answering your question. Yeah, right. But it's for them. There are studies that make that claim both ways. Okay. Right? There's no question that crime is not a single issue cause. And I'm not claiming that simply not having cops means that there's crime. What I am suggesting is that if you have police officers that project a visible presence, you discourage people from making bad choices and you encourage them to make good choices. When so many small children under the age of five were murdered in this city last year by random bullets fired by cars that were shooting at each other in East and West Oakland, do you think that that was the product of not having jobs? They were shooting at each other because they, they shot that child because they didn't have a job. Okay. 
Let, please don't shout. Don't shout. It's not a call and answer. It's a call and response. Let me ask the question. Right. Let no, me don't, ask the question ask rhetorical, a different way. Don't ask rhetorical questions to okay. the audience because All right. you can't get a response. The point about those children being shot, think about this for just, I'm listening to you. Listen to me also, please. Yeah. Would those people have been shooting at each other if the police had been present? If a police officer was there, they would have been shooting at each other. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't agree with you. Okay. I don't agree right. with you on this. Okay, obviously so, crime John, and the the police answer, are right, big issues, yes. okay. Go ahead. So to your question about staffing, Right. We have 612 officers now. We've added a few more with an academy, but we have a department that is contracting every year. We lose 60 officers to attrition every year. We have 153 officers who are about to hit the age of 50, all within a three-year period. In the current state of the department where morale is low, it's likely that they will all go. And if we don't find money to hire, to at least maintain the force we have or try to grow it, this department will contract. Now, if you really think that that's a good thing and you don't want police, then I'm not your candidate. But if you agree with me that having police to project at least a visible presence, I'm not saying arrest your way to a solution, but a visible presence for deterrence, then I ask you to rethink your position on this. Oakland cannot afford, cannot afford another crime Thank wave like what we've had. Thank you. Brian, do you, come on, give, give that. Brian, you've heard uh, Joe's responses uh, related to police and the crime problem. Do you agree with these positions, or, or is it, you have another slant on this? Yeah, well, I think that the answer, truthfully, is somewhere between where Dan and Joe are. I don't think that these are mutually exclusive options. Certainly, we need more police. Right now, uh, our response times when somebody is robbed uh, are abysmal. Uh, the follow-up rates to crimes and uh, having evidence go through uh, and look at and try to solve crimes, uh, it's abysmal. So I do think, and my number is 800, uh, that we do need more police, not only for the visible presence, but to uh, extend a feeling of safety and some feeling of confidence that the tax dollars that we're putting out there are gonna do something. Now, my solution is much more than that. My solution is the police and the community working together. The only way that we're gonna solve this is through community policing and having those additional officers show up in those neighborhoods and being visible and forming relationships so that the community, in the first instance, is a part of our alert system. In the second instance, they're helping us form crimes. Number three, cleaner neighborhoods. We've got to do something about the dumping in the city and the tagging that goes on. Number four, and the purpose of this, thank you, and the purpose of this forum is root causes in longer term. It's got to be about education. So thank God for uh, Dr. Webb and all the other educators like her. We have got to make the education playing field much more even in the city of Oakland. And then lastly, I do come back and agree with, uh, with Dan. My fundamental concept or precept is that this is about poverty. This is about economic inequality and having more access to jobs and people finding their way out of poverty has a direct correlation with the reduction of crime. I would use technology as a force multiplier for our police officers to help us be more efficient with the limited resources we have. Thank so that's you, my plan. You. Good. Dan, uh, it seems that um, there's some agreement and not with your position. So what's your view as the mayor, if you were the mayor, how would you go about resolving this sort of incompatible positions between more police, more violence, or less violence? Okay, I'll take that on. You know, um, I said it first, but New York Mayor Bill de Blasio said that we need a police department that protects people's property, their lives, and their constitutional rights. And all three of those concepts are compatible. It is probably nothing that is more disgraceful about Oakland City government and those who have been part of this that for 12 years we have been under a federal court's consent decree. Think about that. There is no city in the United States that has been under federal control for even half as long as that. It's an incredible disgrace that our city leaders have not been able to find a police chief who will keep officers under control and the tens of millions of dollars we spend on police abuse settlements and judgments. Now, practically, I want to hire a new chief, a chief who will end that consent decree by complying with its requirements within a year, save us tens of millions of dollars. Now, how many cops do we need? You know, people throw out these numbers that are completely 
arbitrary, have no basis in fact. Do you know it takes five officers to staff one patrol position 24-7, 365 days a year? If you think of how many street corners there are in Oakland, how many officers would it take to prevent what happened to Joe's son? 10,000 officers, 20,000 officers, it's absolutely impossible. My proposal is concrete. It's based on real numbers. We have 60 community policing beats in Oakland. Each should have five patrol officers, one problem solving officers, two investigators, and one sergeant to keep things under control. That would take 540 officers. Fewer than we have today, but twice as many on the street as we have today. Their job would be to work with the community councils in those communities to focus and solve violent crime while protecting people's rights. That's what we need to do. And we can do that with a department, as I say, 540 carrying out these patrol functions, perhaps another 100 or 150 taking on administration, other specialized responsibilities. And those are concrete numbers, not numbers that people pull out of the sky of eight or 900. But the key, in my opinion, and we can go back 200 years. Uh, I'm a student of Sir Robert Peel, who created the Metropolitan London Police Department 200 years ago. I'll leave you with two concepts that we need to follow. Number one, the police are the members, members of the community whose job it is to ensure community safety. Our police have to be members of our community, not outsiders. Secondly, the police will be effective if and only if all people see them as acting impartially and completely fairly in their responsibilities and in their relations with all the people in Oakland. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. So, Mr. Liu, yes. you are and have talked to us um, at each opportunity about business and the importance of bringing people uh, into business. Do you have any concrete ideas, or if so, what are they? about if you were mayor to implement your vision about bringing youth into business? First, first. Hello? OK. OK. If, if I was the mayor, uh, I would have conventions where the people who are underpaid, uh, unemployed, will come to the convention, and I will group them into zip codes, uh, in odd numbers, and they would each share their ideas of a business. Uh, take 10 minutes to share their idea of a business through their respective groups, and whoever has the best idea for the business will be chosen as the leader uh, for a new company. And that's how all companies start. Because when you have people that you're working with, you can assign which ones is gonna be a leader, the president, uh, the secretary, and the um, uh, but but you don't view the mm -hmm. the city structure as a corporate business, do you? I mean, do you see it that no, way? No, they, they they start out with a business as unincorporated, and once they found a successful idea that they could make money from, then at which point they could uh, incorporate the business. Okay. Uh, get, have get you it had official. an opportunity to look at the Oakland City budget? Have you seen the budget? Uh, no. Mm -hmm. All right, so the question there would be, if you have these great ideas, where in the budget would you see that the money can be found to help you develop these programs? The program is, uh, is it doesn't require uh, any money. In fact, it just requires a room, uh, a speaker that knows how to uh, coordinate the game, and it would be self-educational for them. They have the game rules, uh, and they could play Play it. Okay. Yes. All right, thank you. So, <laughs> Mr. Anderson? Yes, yes. Mr. Anderson, um, you talked a lot about some of your community activities. In, in terms of, have you had an opportunity to look at the relationship between the city of Oakland and the port of Oakland? Uh, and if so, how do you see the 
the, the city benefiting from the activities of the port given that they have different structures, if you will? Yes. Okay. Check, check, okay. Yes, I have. Uh, actually, uh, I started with Occupy Oakland when they shut down the port twice. That's where I started learning about the port and the fact that they don't pay business tax. Uh, so uh, how would we develop that? We would actually put pressure on them to pay taxes to the city of Oakland so we could use some of those billions of dollars of money that come in a day to support the people of Oakland. That simple. Well, let me just ask Brian this question. Because Brian's on the port. Is that doable, what he just said? Uh, so, no, I think we got to get our facts right a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, we're, one, we're not talking about billions. The, the annual revenue of the port is about $600 million. Uh, we have a hundred million that goes to debt service right off the top. So there is in fact very little uh, that's even left over to go back into investing and improving our capital equipment uh, and other things that we need to do around the port. I think that the, uh, the, that the port should be a much better partner. The port should be uh, partnering with the community colleges, with the unions and training people uh, and using our Oakland Army base where we're going to have 5,000 uh, jobs to get people back to work. But the key is growth. If the port could grow 20%, we would create 16,000 jobs. We could put a lot of Oaklanders back to work that would in turn be contributing money back into our economy. If we can get the port growing in the right way, I do see uh, a more uh, sustainable contribution being able to go back uh, to Oakland. But I think we've got to be aware of what the finances are uh, and get it structurally right, which we are on the way. Uh, we have uh, hired the executive director from the Long Beach Airport. Uh, we have a maritime person that's coming to grow that business. But if you segment it, the business is, the major contributors are maritime and airport. The airport revenues are pretty much captive within the airport, and they have to be invested, uh, reinvested by FAA regulation to safety things around the airport, which leaves mostly maritime to reinvest. So the key is growth so that we can get uh, out from under our debt pay that down, be able to reinvest in things like the cranes and other operating equipment, and put Oaklanders to work. That's what we're aiming to do. Okay. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Ms. Sidebottom? I have a question from the audience that essentially says, or asked a question, what is your vision slash mission on how to provide access and equity to the students of Oakland? That's kind of a tough question. <laughs> it, is, it is a very tough question. Um, and the reason it's a tough question is because you're talking about students and then you're talking about a lot of adults that are no longer students that need the same help that fill that same question. As a mayor, <laughs> do you see that that's a role that you could play? No, I think that I think as the mayor, all I can do is work to bring jobs to Oakland, and that's one. Of, that's the role that the mayor needs to play is bring economic development to the city. Mm -hmm. But working with students, it has to go through the colleges, and through businesses, and the draw needs to come from the businesses that we bring to Oakland. And it's not just an uh, yes. There's a lot of mom and pop businesses, entrepreneurs that are building. Their businesses in Oakland, and that's what's sustaining Oakland right now. That's but we don't. But we need a sales tax base, and that's part of Oakland's problem. And that's one of the things. When you're talking about the students here, the students up at Merritt, but then you also have to talk about the future. The 18-year-olds that are not going to be going to school, that are going to want to work. And what are they being taught? And how are they going to be able to be part of society in the city of Oakland? We need to start looking at that, such as bringing the shop programs back so that people you, learn you, how to... Do you see that as uh, something that the mayor can do? Or is I, that... think this, I think the mayor can be a push behind it, but the mayor, his or herself, cannot do that alone. It has to be a, a function of um, the economic development of the city that needs to be a be part of where the schools come into play, where the Chamber of Commerce has come into play, and where businesses being com come into the city work together Good. to Thank formulate you. that. Thank you. Mr. Washington? No. Who are you? No. I keep getting Williams. it wrong. Williams. Washington there Williams. Go. I got him in first. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I didn't, but 
the question that I have in, is that there's this perpetual discussion about the budget, budget deficits and our surpluses, and there's always a question of whether or not there's enough money to take care of Oakland's uh, business, uh, some of which are obligated to do, some of which is not. As, as the mayor, how do you see uh, sort of balancing the budget, if you, if you will? Well, to start off with, I want to go say something to you that you would understand, and I think of all the whole panel. Uh, the chemical composure of Oakland PD is, is a problem. The what? I'm sorry? The chemical compo composure, the chemistry of it. Oh, the chemistry of the department. Yeah. And okay. I, I, would, I, I would, I just want to say this to get, get off going. Uh, constitutional law is one thing, but civil law is, is another thing. And I, I would uh, invoke somebody like you to teach civil law to OPD and get the morale out. I'm sure they'd be, they'd be very happy for that to occur. Hey. I've been teaching them this, for 25 Mr. years. They don't Mr. listen Mr. all the Burris, time. Mr. Burris. You throw an iron in the fire, make sure there's fire on it. Am I right? I, that's a homily that I appreciate. Okay, look at, looking at the budget, uh, I don't know a whole lot about the Oakland budget, but what I do see is that we do need to, number one, get rid of this tarnish off the city, number two, create jobs that would infuse into the tax bases, and that would solidify the budget at the same time I will look at where the waste is. Uh, there's got to be a lot of waste here. Uh, the two people that I, I did research on everybody here, I'm gonna tell you that. <laughs> yeah, I did research on everybody. Uh, Ms. Ruby, you're a jewel, I'm gonna tell you that, okay. You're a jewel. Yeah, why don't, why don't you just All right. answer, answer the question you know, about. But I, I, I would look at the whole budget, you know, and I'll, Analytically, I will go through the budget and look at where we are, what we're doing, and how much we have, and where we're going to go, and project that and use that projection. There's going to have to be some cost cutting. Have you, uh, I know you haven't really looked at it, maybe this is not a question for you, but there's this question about obligations to public people in terms of their pensions. The obligation is a huge uh, segment of the budget. And there's a question of whether or not that is something that has to be cut back in order to sustain it, because it, can over, it may overwhelm the, the city budget in the future. And the question is, given some thought to that, what do you, what do you see there, if anything? I would, look the at, I would look at the waste of each department first before I go cutting benefits. And then if it's without a doubt imperable that that has to happen, it has to happen. Ms. Ruby, as the, um, thank you, as the city auditor, do you have, and now want to be mayor, do you see that there's a role uh, for the mayor in looking at the existing pensions and obligations that you have to public employees as an area that needs to be uh, adjusted in the future? And if so, uh, how would you go about doing it? And if not, why not? So I, uh, I just, you my office of the city auditor, we just issued a report on unfunded liabilities a yeah. week and a half ago. And this is a critical conversation. What we know is that Oakland's not the outlier, but we have a $1.5 billion unfunded liability. And this what, what is what we mean? owe what that today. So this is your credit card. So mm -hmm. employees have come to work. They get benefits, they get pensions, and this is the benefits that they've accrued. So this is the cost that they get based on how many years of, they've worked for the city, they get a percentage of their salary that's multiplied, and we already owe $1.5 billion. There isn't a way to reduce that. We, ne we need to figure out how to pay that. So what the report that I just issued talked about is that we need a stakeholder solution on this, and everyone needs to be at the table. So the city leaders who have stuck their head in the sand about the unfunded pension liabilities need to be at the table with the union, with the citizens. There needs to be impartial financial analysis as well as in, impartial and independent legal analysis of what our, what our options are. And we need to drive this at Sacramento. This is the part where why are we not leading in these conversations instead of making excuses or coming to the table 
looking for handouts. The pension unfunded liabilities are, again, this is a, pro this is a problem that is a nationwide, and we could be participating in the table. A letter was sent to the Senate and the Assembly in 2012 by eight of the 11 largest cities in California that said this is impacting our citizens and our employees and our ability to provide services. Oakland didn't sign that letter. That's unacceptable. Okay. Thank you, thank you. The next question that I have though <laughs> is about minimum wages, minimum wage. We all know that the president uh, has historic, has tried to get a minimum wage of $10.10 for federal contractors, uh, for their employees. In the city of Oakland, Joe, <laughs> do you think uh, Oakland should have a minimum wage? And if so, why? And if not, why not? If you were the mayor and had to discuss this issue. I think you mean, do you think we should increase the minimum wage? I, I don't have a view. I'm just saying, do you? Well, you ask the question, yeah, do you think yeah, we should do you, have one? Do you think we should increase the minimum wage? And if so, why? And yeah. if not, why not? And what impact do you think it would have on the city's budget okay. if you, in fact, did it? I think I got it. Okay. okay. So the first part of the answer to this question is yes. I think it is necessary to increase the minimum wage uh, in Oakland uh, for some real simple reasons for other questions we didn't get asked tonight that I thought we were going to get asked about the growing gap the uh, income uh, disparity gap between uh, rich and poor and the shrinking middle class, which is really more, going more to the poor side of the equation than the rich side of the equation. The reality in Oakland today uh, is that, uh, as I said before, uh, unemployment is still higher here by about 4% than anywhere else in the county. Uh, the level of poverty, especially in East and West Oakland, is higher and more concentrated here. And even for people who have resources, who went to college and have college degrees, some of you in this room, it's still difficult to find work. We are in a recovery from this last great recession that is still mostly jobless because lots of businesses and corporations have money, but that money is still sitting on the sidelines and they're waiting to see if they're going to invest it. And if they don't invest it, they don't create economic activity, construction, things like that, that generate jobs. So the reality is costs are going up, People don't have as much discretionary income as they used to. There are benefits that accrue to people who are wealthy that don't accrue to people who are poor. And in a place like Oakland, because our land is so inexpensive, partially because of our crime problem and also because of other, other issues, we're now finding in San Francisco, as I'm sure you all know if you live in West Oakland, that there are lots of people who are being moved out of there who are coming here with money and either buying houses or encouraging people who own housing in West Oakland to remodel and fix it up and try and pass the cost of that on to renters in a move to basically make them move, or flipping houses altogether. And where do those people go? This is the disparity that we see now, and this is also the problem that we have, which is why increasing a minimum wage to try and get it closer to something that's a little closer to reality is necessary. Now, I find it very interesting that my good friend Dan, and we are friends, we're just debating tonight, was criticizing me earlier for coming up with numbers without basis. Dan has said we should raise the minimum wage to $15. I'll wait for you later to tell me exactly where you got that number, besides just saying it sounded good in an election. I can tell you anecdotally, and I'm sure maybe you can, I'll wait to hear you. But I can tell you, Dan, I've canvassed in every part of the city already. When I talk to small businesses, like the kind that Pam represents over in the Lakeshore area, and I talk to small business owners who have a very thin margin, maybe a restaurant owner who has maybe one or two employees, talking about going from eight or nine dollars to fifteen dollars an hour is scary. It's scary to them. When I talk to some big businesses, they're willing to pay more. And in a place like Oakland, they're not afraid to do that. But they're thinking more on the scale of two to three dollars an hour, not a six dollar swing. Now, I'm not opposed to going all the way to fifteen dollars, but I think the responsible thing to do first is to study this to look at the impact not just to claim that if all the cities in the Bay Area raise it, our employers won't have any choice, they'll have to do it, but actually study this. The people who generate jobs in Oakland, which ultimately, according to everyone, is the solution to our problems, are small businesses. You should be looking at them first to find out, can they afford an increase, and is that increase proportionate for what Oakland needs? 
Well, I would back it if that's the case. Is that your position that it should be two or three dollars? That is to say, go to 10, 11? Is that no, what I've said is that's what I'm hearing now. Okay. I want to study this to find out if we're going to lose business. I don't want to force out small business owners because they can't make that. What about if, the city? If the study the indicates that people can afford that, I'm fine with that. Okay. All right, Dan, uh, you've been called out. Uh, and, uh, Thank you. I am sympathetic to small businesses, but I guess I'm more sympathetic to working people who can't afford to pay the rent and buy groceries and take care of their kids. It costs $77,000 for a family of four in the city of Oakland on an annual basis to have housing, food, the basic necessities of life, what's called a living wage. $77,000 for a family of four means if you have two wage earners, they have to make 20 bucks an hour. If you have one and the other adult is at home, it's $39 an hour. So $15 is a step in the right direction. It's not enough, but it's a step in the right direction. And there is a national movement for $15 an hour. In Sa San Francisco recently, public opinion polls overwhelmingly in favor of 15. In Seattle, Public opinion polls overwhelmingly in favor of 15. 15 is becoming the standard. It's still not a lot of money. You know, the, the, one of the ideas that motivates me is, again, thinking about income inequality and the inability of people who make the current minimum wage or less to support their families. I am shocked and outraged by the fact that people who work for businesses that pay the current minimum are on welfare. So you can work full time at Walmart or McDonald's, full time, get what they pay you, qualify for Section 8 housing, qualify for Medi-Cal, qualify for other benefits that we all pay, which means, of course, that we are subsidizing Walmart and McDonald's instead of vice versa. Thank 15 you, is you, a Dan. step in the right direction. I'm open to ideas about uh, exemptions for very small businesses. I'm open to ideas about phasing this in over time, but income inequality is the number one issue in the United States in terms of achieving social and economic justice. I don't want to make this a Dan and Joe show, but a brief, brief reply, and then I'm going to give everyone an opportunity to give a closing comment. Okay, thank you. Brief. I'll make it brief. Look, I didn't hear a study I heard there's a trend, he compared Seattle and San Francisco to Oakland. Do you think the business community in Seattle and, uh, and uh, San Francisco is comparable to what we have here in Oakland? I don't. I'm not gonna ask rhetorical questions anymore. All right. <laughs> the, Socratic, the reality Socratic. is we need to increase what people take home so that they can live. I get that. But arbitrarily saying it's $15 because some other cities are trying that is not responsible. Small businesses in this city are the employment generators. They produce the most jobs. Otherwise, our biggest employers in Oakland are public sector. They generate no revenues for the city, and they don't give all their jobs to the people who live here. If the solution is jobs, you have to be thoughtful about taking care of the businesses that are here, and I mean the small businesses. And for anybody that we're trying to recruit to come here to create new jobs, including technology, hospitality, any of the others we've talked about, I want you to think about the impact of policies like this where we're being a little bit haphazard with these numbers. We should study this first and make sure that the impact is not disproportionately harmful to the businesses that are here. I am very much for making sure that we reduce income inequality, but not at the expense of driving these businesses out. If you do that, there are no jobs for anybody. Thank you, thank you. So what I'm going to do now, uh, we're getting close to the end, is that I'm going to allow each person to make a closing statement on any subject that they would like. It could be in responsive to something that's been said, to clarify your particular position that you had earlier, but take one minute and say what you got to say, starting at the end here and going to the next person. Of course, I'll be the gong if I have to be. Again. A again. A again. One minute. Again. One minute. Okay, Mr. Burris. Restructuring Oakland. Rezoning, controlling the schools, we control crime. We will have more money in the city coffers, number one. Number two, 
bring OPD up to par, get somebody in there who knows analytically how to do things, okay? And number four, get rid of the bad tarnish that we have. Businesses will come, a lot of problems will be alleviated, and it's not rocket science. We just need money real quick, and the rezoning is the way to do it. Thank you, thank you. We have to look at Oakland in a bigger setting, and that's quality of life. Police are just a part of it. Economic development is part of it. Public works, park and rec. And we need to look at how many people are now working for the city of Oakland. They aren't hiring people on the street to do the jobs, to fill the potholes. They're hiring management. And those people are not working to fill those potholes and do the sewer work that needs to be done. We need to bring jobs to Oakland, but we also need to make opportunity available. We talk about raising the minimum wage. That's all fine, but we don't have businesses in Oakland that can sustain that. You can talk about ideals. And everybody can make promises and say that's what they're working on, but reality is, is that we are in hard times. And I'd like to know how many of you know people that are graduates, that have PhDs, that can't get jobs in the fields they graduated in. You need to start looking at what the United States of America is becoming and how we're going to bring businesses back here. We need to start in Oakland at the local level and get the movement going. San Francisco is growing. And the, and the dot coms are all building up the rents over there. Well, guess what? It's coming over here to Oakland. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Okay. When they say education opens the door uh, for opportunities, that, that door has to be opened by somebody, and it's an employer. Uh, what I would do is under my community, community safety empowerment plan is have them to make the whole house, to create the jobs, the companies. And, and I envision that with my plan, uh, hundreds of business will be started and they will be the new uh, employers in Oakland that who, who would uh, provide the jobs to the people. And uh, also regarding to the police, uh, I have a plan that works with the current uh, number of police that we have. Uh, what, what I do is uh, have each officer uh, set up a neighborhood watch with 7 to 25 uh, volunteers. And out of those volunteers, uh, we would have monitor of uh, surveillance uh, in high and medium crime areas, which is not monitored uh, solely by the police but by the public, the citizens, the residents who live here. So that if they see a crime that is happening outside on the streets, they can view it from the safety of their own homes without going out to look and endanger themselves. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Lewis. All right. All right. Hey everybody. So there's some things that we all ought to consider. And that is this, everyone, to one degree or another, has an entrenched position about something they think is important. Um, we want a thousand cops in every neighborhood in Oakland. We want, um, what are they called? Um, solar panels on every home in Oakland. We want everyone to have a job in hospitality. Um, here's the thing. The city of Oakland is in trouble. And obviously, we aren't going to go much further if we are all entrenched in this view that it's mine and nobody else. I'm arguing this. We need leadership that looks at the entire family of Oakland and says, can we move forward together from here? What's possible in seeing a vision that puts all of us on the front line together rather than making sure that somebody is left behind? Thank you. I think there are no shortage of ideas. I think what we need is a leader uh, as our next mayor 
uh, who cares, uh, who can lead, and who can execute. I was finishing up canvassing in East Oakland uh, one afternoon, and I talked to a woman named Mrs. Lopez. And what she told me was that she had to jump on the floor two to three times a week because gunshots were being fired, uh, and she covered her kids. So until we do something about making every citizen in this city more safe, we have to realize that there are fundamental hurdles for people even getting to school and having a quality education. Education, we have 60% of the schools in this city that are in tier three and tier four. We've got to bring those up and make sure everybody has a better uh, educational experience. Jobs, we need real jobs and real plans and real numbers. My plan is to create 20,000 jobs in this city by the year 2020. Healthcare, port, retail, uh, and technology. I have uh, a history of taking a healthcare business over the last four years that I grew from being a failing division to uh, $400 million to one that was producing $800 million in revenue that was profitable and put people back to work. I care about this community. I lead with my heart, but I have the skills to get us back on track, to get us growing, and get us being highly uh, effective and having the money to invest in our education and having the money to invest in a fully staffed police force. I thank, hope you'll consider you. me as your thank next mayor. Thank you, thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, John, for your great questions. Dr. Webb, thank you for hosting this event. So as the mayor of Oakland, I will fight for public safety every day. That until we have a safe city, we will not not be able to attract businesses to come here with high paying jobs and the industries that we want to attract so that they bring their workers here and that we increase our economic base. It is by being a safe city that we will be able to thrive and that's step one. So I will focus on public safety every day. I will take the dollars, the millions of dollars through fraud, waste and abuse and I will put it to public safety first. And I have done that in my work as city auditor. I've identified $2 million that was paid out for technology when we talk about improving the police department. $2 million that was paid out in technology never used or underused. $2.3 million that was owed back to businesses and citizens for overpaid parking tickets. $3 million that was paid out in error prematurely or not in agreement with city contracts when I looked at the payroll system in the city of Oakland. So I know that we need to manage our city well. I have this expertise. I have turned a trouble agency into a model of accountability, transparency, and results. When we talk about results, I'll put my results online. You'll be able to track them. We'll come up with real plans that we implement and then we'll drive the results home and if we need to implement changes, we'll do them in real time so we make it a safe, thriving, economically viable city. Thank and you, I, thank you. Thank you, yeah. thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight and John, thank you for getting most of our names right and for all the good questions. <laughs> and. Uh, in all seriousness, I'd like to close tonight uh, by just emphasizing a couple of things. I mentioned in my introduction that public safety is also something that I care about. Uh, I'm serious about that. Jobs, development, dealing with education and housing, addressing poverty are the ways of addressing the root causes of crime. But dealing with the symptoms of crime involves investment in violence prevention programs and addressing in an honest and thorough and thoughtful way staffing levels for the police. That is what I'm about. It'll be the narrow focus for this campaign. Education is a component of dealing with poverty. We've talked about community colleges tonight, appropriately so because of the venue, but we haven't talked that much about K through 12. Right now we spend between 75 and $85,000 a year per student K through 12, up from kindergarten up to 12th grade. We spend 10 times that much to incarcerate one prisoner in our state prison system. Our priorities are out of whack. And in a place like Oakland with limited resources and flight from the poorest parts of our city, we are failing our children. And those children don't have much hope as a consequence of that. I want you to know that as a mayor, I won't forget the fact that I have 32 years in the classroom as a teacher 
at a state university teaching students who come from this school system, not because of the school system, but sometimes in spite of it. That I will be very forceful about trying to remake all of our schools into places that become community centers, longer school days, not just with extracurricular activities in the afternoon, but also investing in doing homework so that when students go thank home, you, they can be students. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much for tonight. Um, here's a study for you. Raising the minimum wage to $15 would add about 40 cents to the cost of a Big Mac. Think about that. That's not going to put McDonald's out of business or any business out of business. What it will do is pump tens of millions of dollars into our economy in increased spending capacity of thousands of families. That will bring up the whole city and will make businesses viable. I also believe that things start with education. If we're going to improve public safety, the schools have to work. The program we need more than anything else, which again has been proven by studies to be the greatest equalizer between children from low-income families and more affluent families, is universal education for all three and four-year-olds. That will be a starting basis for improving our schools, improving our entire city. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, thank everybody for coming out. I really appreciate the, the listening and the, the interaction between the audience. Um, what I would like to see is a future of Oakland that represents all of Oakland, not just any single one group. Uh, I've heard a lot of what the candidate said, and I'm actually impressed. I really love to hear different outlooks, but you want a leader for the city of Oakland, somebody that actually has worked on the ground level and actually has uh, dedicated his real life to moving Oakland forward in a positive way. I'm not a rich man, and I, and I honestly don't aspire to be a rich man. I aspire to be a valuable man. That's what I learned in the military, to be a valuable person. It's not about how much money you have in the bank, but it's about how you're respected in your community. And my community respects me, and the, and the people that know me know that my, my standards are very high for how I treat people and how I treat myself. And I want the same standards for Oakland. My campaign is called Town Mayor. And it's not about me being the mayor, it's about us being the mayor. Anybody that's from Oakland knows we call it the town. And we call it that because it's not like a city. We actually talk to one another. And as a town mayor, it's our responsibility to make Oakland the type of city we want it to be. And you need somebody on the ground level that, isn't, that doesn't have years of hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank. You want somebody that actually can understand the ground level and the hunger of that mother and them sons that don't have the food on their stomach. That the people that really need that help, you need somebody that's gonna really get the ground level and actually translate what happens in City Hall to what happens on the block. And I've been doing that already, so that's why I'm the town mayor. And I implore anybody to understand why you're the town mayor. And if you decide you're a town mayor, support this campaign. Jason Anderson, town mayor, 2014. Right Thank on. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to thank everyone who participated. I want to thank all of you. I thought that everyone was trying to be very responsive to the questions. Uh, I, you know, I could have been better at giving you more pointed questions, but uh, I did think that a lot of good information came out from you, and I hope the audience is in a position to sort of evaluate you individually based upon your collective knowledge or your experience, your vision, uh, and, you know, how the, and their sense of what you would look like as a leader if you were chosen as the mayor.